I say something? What if I say something useful? Today we want to talk about L'Hopital's rule. This is a rule that we can apply to limits where just kind of like plugging things in or letting things go to infinity results in a limit that's zero over zero or infinity over infinity. These are two of our indeterminate forms. Because zero over zero, we don't just say undefined when it's zero over zero. If it's a constant divided by zero, one divided by zero, that's undefined. We can't assign a value to that. Zero over zero might be something depending on those zeros. The question that comes up, the reason that we get indeterminate forms is that we're not just looking at zero over zero. We're not just thinking about that static division. We're thinking about what's happening as we're approaching zero. That's the indeterminate form part. We're not just looking at a static zero divided by zero. That doesn't mean anything. We're thinking about what zero divided by zero means when we're thinking about how the, that the numerator is going towards zero and the denominator is going towards zero. We're thinking about not plugging in zero and looking at a static zero over zero. We're looking at what's happening as the numerator approaches zero and as the denominator approaches zero. Because in calculus, that's how we quote, plug in zero or plug in infinity. We look at what's happening as we get close to zero in situations where we can't just plug in zero. Same argument goes for what happens with infinity. We can't just plug in infinity, it's not a number. It doesn't mean anything to say what's infinity plus one. That doesn't mean anything. We can't use it in operations, it's not a number. Infinity is not a number. So when we say something like what's infinity divided by infinity, it depends on what those infinities are doing. What's happening as the numerator gets large what's happening as the, new, the denominator gets large, what's happening to that ratio. So we're not really plugging stuff in, even though we like to say plugging in infinity because we're lazy. We got to think there's a lot more going on when we say something all sloppy, like plug in infinity. What's happening as those values get larger and larger and larger. So, L'Hopital's rule is for dealing with limits that end up being zero over zero or infinity over infinity. See, we're already doing it. That's how much faith I have in y'all. It's like, well, we can have this like this cool language. Where we're like, well, let's plug in infinity. We can be like that because y'all are talking to students. You've unlocked being able to say shit like plug in infinity. Because I know you all know we're not like actually plugging in infinity. Infinity squared plus one. You're thinking, what happens when x gets arbitrarily large? So here's what we do. So oops. Here's the form of L'Hopital rules. Uh, L'Hopital's rule. Let's suppose that we have two functions. One of them is going to be the numerator. One of them is going to be the denominator. And let's suppose that both of those functions are headed towards zero. If we just tried to plug in A, we get zero over zero. This is no good. But what we can think about with L'Hopital's rule is you could say, we can think about how is f of x getting to zero? And how is g of x getting to zero? And are those two things similar? So if we got a limit as x approaches a, just plugging in would give us zero over zero. That'd be bad. We could just think about what's happening as x approaches a how are these functions getting to zero? Note that we're not taking the derivative of f over g. We're just taking the derivative of the numerator separate, separate from the derivative of the denominator. We're not applying the quotient rule. We're just saying, what's the numerator doing on its way to zero? What's the denominator doing on its way to zero? So here, just plugging in a is going to result in a zero over zero.
Plugging in A gives us zero over zero, not helpful. L'Hopital says, just take the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator and look at that ratio. See if that gives you something. Note that this is not the quotient rule. We're looking at how our f and g going to zero. So really this question is about how f and g are going to zero. We're looking at those tangent lines, thinking about tangent lines. This requires some things. F and G have to be differentiable. That was that mysterious gap. Let's look at an example. Limit as x goes to infinity of e to the 2x minus 1 over x. But this one looks familiar. Yeah, I just totally stole it. It's like making a TV show out of a book. Every once in a while, you just got to like film a scene from the book. So the people that read the book, like, oh, I recognize that one. So notice if we just let x approach zero, we get e to the two uh, e to the zero, which is one minus one is zero. Just plugging in zero gives us zero over zero. That tells us we can't just plug in zero. That's not helpful. We don't know what zero over zero is in this case. But it does tell us that we can use L'Hopital's rule. Just plugging in gave us an indeterminate form of zero over zero or infinity over infinity. So we can use L'Hopital's rule. Now, we're not taking the derivative of the fraction. We're not using the quotient rule. We're just taking the derivative of the numerator and the derivative of the denominator. So f of x, our numerator f of x, is e to the 2x minus 1. So f prime of x is 2e to the 2x. Our denominator g of x is x. And so our derivative g prime of x is just 1. So the limit as x goes to 0 of e to the 2x minus 1 over x is the same as the limit as x goes to 0 of the derivative of the numerator, 2e to the 2x, over the derivative of the denominator, 1. Important thing to note here, we're not using the quotient rule. We're doing the separate derivative of the numerator, derivative of the denominator.
But now when we plug in zero over zero into the top and the bottom, in the top we get zero to, uh, sorry, two e to the two times zero, so two, two. And in the denominator, we get one. So we get two over one. Now we can just plug in zero. Two e to the zero is two. And one is one. Now that we're looking at the derivatives, the part that was causing a problem, getting zero over zero, has gone away. Now we can plug in zero to the top and bottom. This is multiple here. questions? I think when you're actually right, multipol, there should be like a little pointy thing over the O, but I can't remember if it's over the O or not. One thing to note, Remember, we're not taking the derivative of the fraction, and we can do this um, over again. So if we still get a 0 over 0, if we still get an indeterminate form, we can just do it again. So for example, if we have the limit as x goes to 0 of e to the x minus x minus 1 over x squared. This one is built to require a repetition. Notice it in the numerator. I'm going to have the derivative. It's still going to give us that 1 minus 0. And in the denominator, when we take the derivative, we're still going to have that x. But if we take a second derivative, we're going to have just a 2. And so that's going to change that. So if we plug in. Uh, if we plug in zero, I get zero minus zero minus uh, one minus zero minus one over zero squared, zero over zero. Can't use that as a result. I don't know what zero over zero is in this case. In the previous example, it was two, but it's not always going to be two. It depends on what's going on. It depends on how the numerator and denominator are getting to zero. So we apply L'Hopital's rule. We take the derivative of the top and the derivative of the bottom. The derivative of e to the x minus x minus 1 is e to the x minus 1 my, uh, plus 0. And in the denominator, the derivative of x squared is 2x. We're using L'Hopital's rule, so now we're going to try to plug in 0. We try to plug in 0. And we get 0 over 0 again. That did not give us a result, but that's fine. It does tell us that we can use L'Hopital's rule. And so we're going to use L'Hopital's rule. The derivative of e to the x minus 1 is going to be e to the x. And the derivative of 2x is just 2. And now we're not going to get 0 over 0.
Now, when we plug in zero, e to the zero goes to one, two goes to two, and so our limit is one half. And now, for now, we can't plug in zero. So we can repeat our um, L'Hopital's rule. We're looking at the derivative. We're looking at the direction. We're thinking about tangent lines of the numerator and denominator, and we're looking at the ratio of those tangent lines. Actually, the ratio of the slopes of the tangent lines. So this is based on approximating functions with lines. Oops, I just wrote that as based on tangent lines, but I wrote it out of view. I'm not trying to write secret stuff. Any questions? How's that writing? Okay. The same thing happens if we have infinity. I suppose I should have written this with uh, infinity. I'm going to be lazy about it and say, what if A is infinity? <laughs> So let's think about this with some uh, functions that we already know. And let's just mention that it also works for A being infinity. So here is the same setup. We got infinity over infinity. We know that the limit here should be three fifths. Just by thinking about it, if we plug in exceptionally large values of x, I've got three billion and two, who cares? Over five billion, the billions cancel out, I get three fifths. If I use a larger value, if x is a 10 to the 27th, then I got three times 10 to the 27th divided by five times 10 to the 27th. I didn't even bother saying plus two or plus seven because who cares when you have 10 to the 27th, two doesn't matter. That's 3 times 10 to the 27th over 5 times 10 to the 27th. That's going to be 3 fifths. For very large values of x, this is going to be 3 fifths. We can get there just by thinking about it. Let's see if L'Hopital's rule agrees. Because if it doesn't, then it's not a rule. And I wouldn't be talking about it. So we know what's going to happen. We know what's going to happen. So if we let x go to infinity, I can't say plug in infinity. That doesn't make any sense. 
So I have to say, let X go to infinity. We get infinity over infinity. That is an indeterminate form. It depends on how we're getting to infinity. So our numerator, f of x, will be 3x plus 2. Our derivative, f prime, is 3. Our denominator, g of x, is going to be 5x plus 7. And we can see where this is headed. g prime of x is just 5. There's the 3 fifths that's going to show up in the next iteration. We apply L'Hopital's rule. This will be equal to the limit as x goes to infinity of 3 over 5. And now, there's nowhere for the x to go to infinity. We just get 3 fifths. And for some reason, I have to cut. I'm not. I'm going to color code it. I used to not like the pink and blue pens together, but then I now I kind of like it. So there it is. This is the same result that we get from just thinking about what's going on. But that's good. We're getting the same result as when we were just thinking about large values of x, but that's good. It's good that it matches with what our intuition is. So that we can, now we're more trusting of it, we can use it in different scenarios. So we know when we're dealing with rational functions, we could just compare the exponents. If the, if, uh, compare the, sorry, compare the degree. I know we got a square root of x, that's not a polynomial, so it's not a rational function. That wouldn't be present in a rational function, but it's rational enough. It's polynomial enough. We just compare the degree of the numerator and the degree of the denominator. If those are the same, then we just need to look at the ratio of the leading coefficients, just thinking in terms of rational functions. If there's an imbalance, if the numerator has a bigger degree, then we go to infinity. If the denominator has a bigger degree, then we go to zero. It's when the degrees match that things are going to infinity at proportional rates. But now I've got a mix of a natural log and a square root of x. I can't just think of degree because natural log doesn't have a degree. It's not a polynomial or a radical function. We've got to do something else. And since we're in the L'Hopital section, probably going to be using L'Hopital's rule. If we just plug in infinity, I get infinity over infinity. That's not helpful in our calculation, except for the fact it tells us that we can use L'Hopital's rule. The numerator is natural log of x. And so the derivative of the numerator is just 1 over x. The denominator is the square root of x. So the derivative of the denominator is 1 half x to the minus 1 half. So we're going to let x go to infinity, still let x go to infinity. But in my numerator, we're going to have a 1 over x. 
and in our denominator, we'll have a one half x to the minus one half. Now I wrote a sideways fraction and a vertical fraction, I don't like it. We're gonna get one over x times two uh, x to the one half. Now we've uh, now we've got x to the one half over an x to the one power, and so we see that the denominator wins. The denominator has a higher degree, so as x goes to infinity, this denominator infinity wins, and this limit is going to be equal to zero. This tells us something very important about the relationship between natural log of x and the square root of x. This tells us that uh, although as x goes to infinity, natural log of x and the square root of x both go to infinity, it looks like the square root of x goes to infinity faster. It's more to it goes to sorry, it goes to infinity. Sorry, infinity. Goes to infinity faster than natural log of x. This particular textbook describes this as dominance. This says that x to the one half, the square root of x function, dominates the natural log of x. What it means is we're going to zero, or we're going to infinity faster than natural log of x. Natural log of x cannot keep up with the square root of x. One might say that the square root of x dominates natural log of x as x goes to infinity. Questions? Notice that I've picked out two, just two of our indeterminate forms zero over zero and infinity over infinity. So if we had something like zero times infinity, that wouldn't be applicable except for the fact that we can turn a zero times infinity into an infinity over infinity. So one thing to note is that this offer only applies to zero over zero and infinity over infinity. We need to be looking at this ratio. It's important, not just for L'Hopital's rule, that we think about this ratio, zero over zero and infinity over infinity. This is one of the ways that we compare things that are going to infinity. We look at the ratio of how they're going to infinity. Are they going to infinity proportionally? Or is one dominating the other? This is an important question, not just for L'Hopital's rule. This is an important future question. That means this is an important way of thinking about things. 
So this is especially the case for things like infinity over infinity. This is how functions, uh, we establish um, how things go to infinity. So this is an important, this is important. So this is more than just L'Hopital's rule. This is saying how we compare things at infinity, how we compare the behavior of functions as x gets arbitrarily large. Natural log of x and the square root of x are not getting uh, are both getting arbitrarily large, but they're not getting arbitrarily large in a similar fashion. The square root of x is growing faster than natural log of x, because the ratio of natural log of x to square root of x is zero. If I flip these over, then I get the reciprocal of zero, which is infinity. That was a very dangerous thing to say. That's me trusting all of you to know what I mean when I say shit like the reciprocal of zero. You should be like, well, um, actually, there is no reciprocal of zero. The additive identity will never have a multiplicative inverse. If you said that, I would be a little bit creeped out because none of you have had like field theory. So I'd be like, oh, uh, that was very suspicious. What are you doing in the Calc 1 class? Spy. That's how I identify the robot sent from the future come to assassinate me. It was okay to just drop that and say that that's how I do that because I've already eliminated the robot from the future sent to assassinate me. Oh, and backup robot, I've already identified you as well. So I can reveal that particular secret. You'd think that robots from the future would have heard me say that and not sent robots that would fall prey to such a tactic, but what can I say? They're robots, they have computers for brains, and therefore are idiots. That's right, computers. You guys are dumb. You kick ass at computing, but you're terrible at thinking. You know what I mean? Computers are very dumb. They will do exactly what you tell them to do, and they won't know the difference. This is why I'm currently just not worried about AI in like a terminative sense. I'm only mildly worried about AI taking over human jobs like teaching, because I'm close enough to retirement, I don't think I need to give a shit, like personally. In a long run scenario for like future generations, wow might be fucked, but personally, I think I'm close enough to bailing. They're like, oh, Leech, now we're gonna replace you with an AI. It's like, oh, no, my retirement replacement will be an AI, and fuck, I don't know. That's what you wanna do. I mean, the important thing to realize is that ChatGPT can't do math. Don't ask ChatGPT math questions, because it doesn't answer math questions, it just mimics human answers. And if it's got a bunch of wrong human answers, it's going to do that. So it's like 10 people have said this, which is wrong. Only one person has said this, which is the actual correct answer. Oh, I'm going to go with all these people that said this is the way it is. It's like fucking voting on math. Now, 10 people said pi is equal to exact, exact, exactly equal to three. So yeah, it must be three, right? Yeah. I know it sounds ridiculous to say we voted on the value of pi, but there was a state in the United States that had a law, attempted to pass a law that pi was exactly equal to three. They said, by law, pi is equal to three. We've known for a very long time that pi is not equal to three and that it is an irrational number and it can't be expressed as a ratio of integers. So that it can't be expressed. And I, even when I was a kid, we didn't have access to slide rules or scientific calculators. So you know what? Use 22 over 7. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good approximation of pi. I have a textbook in my office that says pi equals 22 over 7. That's why if you find someone my age, it's like, oh, pi is equal to 22 over 7. It's just a fraction. They just don't remember.
Anyway, what are we talking about? Oh, yeah. Certain things you just can't vote on. So the, uh, the importance of local college rule is not exactly just evaluating these limits. It's about what it says, how we think about evaluating these limits. Think about tangent lines. What are the tangent lines? How sharp is the point of those tangent lines? Where are we headed? Tangent lines show you where things are headed at a particular moment. I can't evaluate this fraction at a particular moment, but I can look at where the tangent lines are headed at, a, at that particular moment, and that will tell me where the fraction is headed. It also demonstrates, uh, especially for the at infinity ones, as X approaches infinity, it, ex uh, it tells us how to decide whether one function dominates another function. We look at that ratio at infinity. We look at the ratio at infinity, and that tells us how things are dominant. The ratio at infinity. Understanding infinity over infinity is important. That's foreshadowing. Next semester, this is going to come up again. And I'm going to be like, all oh, remember L'Hopital's rule? And you'll be like, oh, no. And I'm like, oh, there's, don't worry, there's no quiz. Then you'll be like, oh, yeah, totally we remember L'Hopital's rule. And then I'm going to remember that I don't have Calc 2 next semester. So hopefully, whoever does have Calc 2, we're going to get to that point in Calc 2 and they're like, oh, remember L'Hopital's rule? At that point, I'm going to need you to be like, oh, yeah, totally, if you were in my class especially if that instructor knows that you were in my class. Because otherwise you're like, well, we don't remember L'Hopital's rule at all. Then I get a call from that instructor. Like, well, what the fuck, dude? Did you not do L'Hopital's rule? I'm like, oh, fuck, I did. And then I'm going to find you all individuals. Like, oh, you fucking burned me. What the hell, guys? I'm just kidding. If you like the next instructor better, what you're going to do is like, oh, oh, he didn't teach us about L'Hopital's rule. Could you teach us about L'Hopital's rule? And then he'll do that. And then you'll be like, oh, yeah, that was better. And then you can send me an email. Like, well, Leach, you suck. I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen next. But this is important. This is how we're thinking about it. So next semester, when you get to improper integrals, and you're talking about comparison of improper integrals, think about L'Hopital's rule. Improper integrals. L'Hopital's rule. Comparison test. L'Hopital's rule. Ratio test, L'Hopital's rule. Just making associations. I'm going to say that shit randomly for the rest of the semester. So that when it comes up, you think about that. All right, that's going to do it for today. I do want, before we pack up, I do want to warn you that Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, I'm not going to be able to run Zoom. So there won't be a Zoom. This is especially true for the eight of you on Zoom. I'm not going to be available to run Zoom on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. There'll be an announcement to this effect on the Canvas. So we'll have a different format on those three days. So just warning, that's going to do it for today. I will see you all on tomorrow as normal. Everybody have a good day and thanks for playing.